Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike. Um, I'm also an MS student I'm in my last year here. Um, I just wrapped up my field work uh, over the summer, and so I'm looking at um, heat stress in um, uh, uh, kitchen workers at uh, New York City public schools. Um, so we thought it might be a good idea for me to um, give the thermal stress lecture for you guys today. Um, also, as a plug for our AIHA student group that I helped lead up, um, I haven't organized it this semester yet, um, but I am doing that in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully we'll get in maybe two or three meetings this semester and then a few more next semester. Um, I think based on just feedback that I've gotten, um, we're going to try to really um, get more speakers in, um, people who have been in the program or in the field. I think that was a popular um, meeting type last semester. So look out for an email from those for those. Um, if you're interested in helping out with the student group, um, feel free to email me or come to me after class and we can um, talk about that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about thermal stress, both uh, heat and cold. Um, so these are the four objectives that we'll be covering today. So we're going to identify some of the common occupational sources of thermal stress, um, understand some of the basic definitions, equations, and health effects of thermal stress, uh, different signs and sy symptoms of health effects associated with thermal stress, um, and then also talk about different controls that we can uh, implement. Um, so in order to describe some of the, the scope of the problem, um, heat stress is really an occupational hazard that depends on um, individual susceptibilities. Um, so for example, we saw in 2008, 2010, um, work-related heat illnesses uh, resulting in emergency room uh, visits were the largest occupational cause um, of emergency room visits in persons 19 to 45 years old, North Carolina. Um, and also there's this case um, in 2012 to 2013, we saw 20 cases of heat illness cited under the general duty clause. Um, 13 of these were fatalities. So that indicates that heat, um, heat exposure and heat illness can really turn into life-threatening illnesses. Um, nine of the 13 of these actually occurred on the worker's first day. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the uh, risks associated with first day work. Um, and none of these cases, uh, or all these cases came from facilities where there wasn't a heat stress program. Yeah. Um, yeah I guess So it could be both, and we'll talk about the different ways that heat is generated. Um, so yeah, work-related heat illness means some kind of um, heat illness generated from heat exposures at work. Does that make sense? Um, versus like a non-occupational exposure to heat where maybe you go for a run on the weekend, that wouldn't necessarily um, and we'll see um, heat illnesses can occur through uh, environmental exposures to heat or heat radiating from equipment pipes. Yeah. Um, so this is just a little bit more detail on um, two of the cases um, that were actually that were fatalities. Um, so you can see that they differ in age. One of them is 36, and one of them is 60. Um, so it doesn't really um, affect elderly. Uh, more disproportionately than younger workers necessarily. Um, both, as I mentioned, occurred on their first day of work. Um, and then we see here that these are kind of mild temperatures, 83 degrees, 84 degrees. We've all experienced that living in New York City. Um, so why is it that they were exposed to these temperatures and ultimately um, developed some kind of heat-related illness and um, passed away? Um, Obviously, we look at that first day of exposure, they weren't necessarily acclimated to the heat. Um, and also because I mentioned that these facilities didn't have um, heat stress uh, programs, they weren't doing a proper training. Um, potentially workers didn't know the signs and symptoms of heat related illness, so they didn't get the um, properly intervene in time to treat those uh, and mitigate those effects of heat. Um, so work can occur in one of these five zones of thermal stress. Um, so we have kind of the 
um, sweet spot of thermal comfort. That's we are just comfortable. It's not too cold, too hot. Um, a warm zone, and then a really hot zone, and a cool zone, and a cold zone. Um, so what about these? Um, these really uh, the margins here, the cold zone, the hot zone. That's where we're going to see the effects um, of of heat, of thermal stress, um, and deviation from that comfort zone can cause uh, accidents to occur, as we'll see. Um, we also see losses of product, uh, productivity at these zones, um, and then uh, the ability to perform complex tasks resulting in uh, potential uh, health and injuries. Um, so this is another graphic representation of uh, kind of the heat zones. This comes from a 14-month study that was conducted to assess uh, the effects of thermal stress. Um, so the authors uh, concluded that they saw um, more proportional behaviors that are unsafe at the higher and lower ends of the spectrum, um, and then less in this kind of thermal comfort zone, 68 degrees here. Um, so as industrial hygienists, we have to um, really anticipate um, any possible thermal stress hazards that may occur in the, in the workplace and when these thermal stresses uh, might come about. Um, so you might um, say you're working at an oil and gas refinery and they're setting up a new unit. Um, that might be, um, and it's in the middle of the day and they're working 12, 12 plus hour shifts. That might be a, um, a spot of intervention where you're going to kind of implement different heat stress controls. Um, it might be an emergency situation, so maybe you have volunteers at the facility or firefighters um, where they're obviously exposed to very high amounts of heat through fire and smoke, um, but they're also wearing PPE, which as we'll see contributes um, to microclimates and can raise your uh, heat stress index. Um, and then also when you're um, Obviously, planning field work projects or out in the field, you just want to be in constant communication with the workers, have the foreman um, checking on the, the workers throughout the day just to make sure that everyone's taking breaks, staying hydrated, um, and everyone's kind of keeping track of the signs and symptoms of, of heat stress throughout the day. Um, so these are some jobs that are uh, commonly associated with heat stress. So we saw emergency response, we talked about the fire and the different microclimates that are um, involved with PPE use. Um, and then obviously construction and uh, military, I think, come to mind. You're outside, um, sometimes in the blazing hot sun for extended periods of time. Um, so that poses a risk of heat-related injury. Um, are there any other occupations that you guys could think of that um, might pose some sort of heat stress-related uh, risks. Yeah. Mining, sure. Yeah. Mining's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. So steelwork and foundries, remediation work. Um, I think those are good uh, examples. Um, other uh, examples might be um, glass manufacturers, um, farmers, if you're outside um, in the heat all day. Um, so we see that um, heat has been an occupational problem for centuries, and it spans a wide range of different occupations and industries. Um, you mentioned the armed forces. A lot of what we know about heat stress actually comes from different studies of um, um, US Armed Force um, members. Um, and then we also have this survival or survivor population when we look at different um, industries where heat exposure might be an issue. Um, usually these industries are kind of self-selecting in, in terms of who uh, is able to do the job under these um, hot, uh, high heat situations. Um, so when we're doing different um, exposure research or epidemiological research, that might be a good point to have in mind that you're looking, you might have some sort of healthy work, work in, these, uh, in these individuals. Um, so on average in the U.S., there are about 15 um, deaths related to occupational heat stress. Um, so they are pretty rare. It's a, a rare occupational hazard. Um, but as we saw, it could affect many different industries. So that's why we, as industrial hygienists, need to just constantly be aware and keeping heat in the back of our minds. Um, 
humidity is definitely one of the driving factors of sleep stress. Um, I know we haven't talked about kind of like the biological um, effects of heat, but can anyone take a guess at why humidity might be um, so important when you're evaluating heat stress? But yeah, prevents evaporation from the body. So um, perspiration, your, your, your body sweats in order to acclimate itself to the heat. Um, it evaporates and it cools you down. In hot, humid environments, it, um, oh, sorry. Um, it, that you're not able to cool yourself down as efficiently in uh, more of a dry type of heat. Yeah. Yeah, per year in the US. So that's like an average. Um, and then, so we also talked or mentioned briefly non-occupational exposures of heat. So those are more common, uh, maybe about 200 to 250 cases per year in the U.S., um, occurring mostly in the elderly population. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Um, heart attacks are a risk of overexposure to heat. Um, and so I think, yeah, if you die of a heart attack, the exposure isn't all the time. Um, so I think, yeah, it definitely could be a fair report in terms of um, occupational. Okay, so we have um, three main components of heat. Um, they are conduction, conduction, and radiation. Um, and I, I've always thought that this picture was really a great representation of just to how to get it into your mind so that these three different um, components kind of stick and make sense. Um, so we'll go each uh, over each of these. Um, so conduction is a transfer of energy between um, objects that are in contact um, with a physical heat source. Um, it's less of a concern in occupational settings because these might be um, really just contained uh, locally. So a worker might forget that they have to wear gloves, touch something hot, um, and the, and the heat related effects are contained to their um, hand. Um, Conduction can be a problem though if large portions of the body are um, exposed to temperatures of greater than 95 degrees, um, or if clothes become wet in cold environments. Um, that's another uh, consideration where conduction is going to contribute to um, cold stress in that case. Um, so convection is the transfer of energy between um, an object and its environment due to fluid motion. Um, so you can mechanically force heat um, with fan, um, or it can kind of um, move via diffusion throughout a space. Um, in the case of diffusion, um, heat loss through convection um, can occur when um, warmer or colder air, I guess, passes over the body. Here taking away the heat from the body. Um, and then, um, sorry. Yeah, that's, and then, um, so water or air across the skin can also cause that, that heat loss if it's um, cooler than the, or the potter can transfer body, uh, transfer heat into the body. Um, and then we also have radiation, which is the transfer of energy from the movement of charged particles. Um, so think about on like a warm sunny day, clear day, you have the sun beating down and you're getting um, that transfer of uh, infrared radiation um, from the sun onto your body. The earth. Um, so these are uh, definitions for heat stress and heat strain that we've been talking about. So Heat stress is the net heat load that a worker is exposed to from the combination of metabolic heat, environmental factors, and clothing. So we see PPE is kind of embedded within that definition. Um, and then heat strain is the body's overall uh, physiological response from heat stress. Um, so we'll take a look at some of these um, physiological responses now. Um, so there's a gradient of heat throughout the body um, and Internal temperature is typically hotter um, than the skin. Most people's internal temperature is about 99 degrees, um, whereas the skin temperature, on the other hand, can, is on average about 80 degrees. Um, 
let's see, in warmer environments, um, blood comes to the surface of the skin in an attempt to cool off the body. Um, and then in colder environments, um, the heat is retained within the core around the, um, the, the organs of the body um, so that they stay at a, at a temperature. So that's, and we'll see this when we talk about cold stuff, but that's kind of why you get this freezing of the peripheries first um, for uh, in events like hypothermia and frostbite. Um, and this is where I wanted to also mention two risk of heart attack that uh, industrial hygiene should be aware of. So in hot environments, um, you're increasing your heart rate because you're trying to pump all of the blood to the, the peripheries. So this is another, um, as Tony mentioned, just another thing to keep in mind on hot days, uh, which is risk of heart attack. Um, so these are some of the um, common responses to heat stress that um, we're aware of because we're all human. Um, visible sweating, elevated heart rate, core temperature increases, um, infrequent urination when you're dehydrated. Um, so the thing with uh, discontinued sweating, that's a really important sign of heat stroke. So during heat stroke, and we'll get into this a little bit, your body um, stops sweating, loses the ability to sweat. Um, so that is one of the key indicators um, that you should keep in mind in hot environments um, as a sign of impending heat stroke. Um, workers in hot environments can also have elevated heart rates um, that above 140 beats per minute. Um, and then core temperatures may also rise to above 100 degrees. So we're seeing that the homeostasis of the human body um, is really being put out of whack when exposed, exposed to um, hot or cold temperatures over prolonged periods of time. Um, so there are also some psychophysiological uh, effects uh, that we mentioned at the beginning of the, um, the lecture. Um, and this is uh, due to the diversion of blood um, to the peripheries. Um, so studies have found that workers um, who are assembling goods um, are more likely to scrape products in hot environments. Um, other studies have shown that students' ability to learn in hot environments is diminished. Um, so these are um, important things to keep in mind. Um, not only the, the physical, effects of heat stress, but also what's happening to behaviors during hot or cold environments. Um, so these are the four main heat illnesses that we'll talk about. Um, so heat stroke, uh, which is the most life-threatening, um, heat exhaustion, heat cramps, and heat rashes, um, which are a little more um, common in the general working population. Um, so heat stroke, as I said, is the most serious and life-threatening of the um, heat-related disorders. Um, core temperatures during heat stroke can exceed 105 degrees, um, which can, if the average internal temperature is 99, it's a very large increase. Um, heat stroke calls for emergency medical attention, um, but if you're ever in the field and you um, there are signs that someone is undergoing heat stroke, you can move them into a shady area, try to cool them down before attention arrives. Um, in addition to lack of sweating, which is a main sign of heat stroke, um, there's also major disruptions in the central nervous system. So someone's sluggish, slurring their speech, um, kind of falling in that consciousness, that might be another um, indicator that they're having a heat stroke. <clears throat> Um, I don't, you know that term? I don't know if that's more of like a, a rip. Yeah, that's core temperature. Yeah, I know. Um, just doing like a little bit of, of research into like how to exactly measure core temperature. Um, there have been some um, devices, industrial hygiene devices, that can actually swallow them, um, and they send like the output of your core. And I think so. I think that is probably the best way to get a 
core temperature, getting buy-in from workers to swallow a piece of machinery and then <laughs> have their core temperature measured, I don't think is, is as easy. <laughs> um, but I think that would be, yeah. <laughs> But that would be the, one of the best way to get it. Yeah. Yeah, it could. Yeah, temporary memory loss. Yeah, not really knowing where they are in their surroundings. Yeah, so if someone just feels off to you and they don't feel like they're really there. Um, heat stroke, it, it can be, um, it, it needs medical attention, but it can be mitigated. You can recover from heat stroke. Um, I don't exactly know, though, I can look it up, the mortality rate or like what, if you're, if you get heat stroke, what are the chances of surviving? I don't know. Um, so heat exhaustion is a milder form of, of heat disorder, and many of us, um, if you're spending time outside in the summer, you may have um, experienced a form of heat exhaustion. Um, this occurs in workers 10 times more frequently than heat stroke, um, and there is a slight increase in body temperature of 100 to 102 degrees during these events. Um, symptoms include headache, nausea, vertigo, um, general body weakness. Um, all things that we might have we may have experienced. Um, it's caused from a um, loss of body fluids and electrolytes, um, and this um, yields prompt or yields quickly with prompt. Um, heat cramps are also a fairly common form of, of heat related um, illness. Uh, these are, these are caused by an excessive loss of salt from excessive sweating. Um, treatment includes IV, salted liquids, so we see a lot of um, athletes drinking Gatorade, um, electrolytes. Um, so once the electrolytes are replenished, um, the heat cramps should dissipate. Um, and then we also have um, heat rash. So this occurs when um, clothing gets wet and remains on the skin um, and it causes an obstruction in the sweat glands. Um, so this causes the glands to swell. You can see from this at the top. Um, it, it can um, get infected, so it's recommended to remove the clothing immediately, uh, rinse off. Um, but if treated, it, it usually quickly um, dissipates. It looks scarier though. Um, and then we also have um, heat syncope, which is basically fainting. Um, so this is caused by a pooling of blood in the dilated vessels. Um, and um, it occurs when, if you're um, immobile for too long, if you're sitting for too long, standing for too long, the blood can pool, doesn't get to the rest of your body. Um, so this can be prevented by getting up um, every now and then, making sure you're constantly moving, um, just so you get the blood flowing for the rest of your um, circulatory system. Um, so as I mentioned, heat-related illness um, definitely is um, indicated on different personal risk factors and susceptibilities um, that may put an individual at greater risk of developing one of these illnesses. Um, so these include um, major ones at least, age, gender, um, body fat ratio, alcohol and drugs, um, and water and electrolyte balance. Um, so as we saw with the, especially with the heat-related um, heat cramps, water and electric balance is, is really important. And we'll go through some of the other ones um, in more detail here. Um, so age, as you age, you lose the ability to compensate for heat. Um, however, older people in general are not at a greater risk of developing heat-related illness if they're allowed to kind of go at a pace that suits them. So if a pace that is too fast um, for them, that out, um, outpaces their ability to compensate for heat, that's when they kind of run the risk of developing a heat-related illness. If you let them work at their own pace, um, replenish water, take sufficient work rest, 
um, breaks, they're not necessarily at an increased risk of uh, developing any of these diseases. Um, we also, there's some um, evidence that women have lower rates of sweating in general uh, compared to men, um, but investigators haven't been able to uh, necessarily link this decreased sweating rate to increased risk of um, so I think that's an ongoing area of research in this field of study. Um, so we also have um, increased body fat ratio. Um, so as your body fat ratio increases, your um, surface area to body weight ratio um, is diminished. Um, and so that also um, inhibits your body to dissipate heat um, as quickly as if you had a lower body um, to surface area ratio. Um, and then alcohol and drug use are really important. Um, I was, sorry, but yeah. <laughs> um, they're, yeah, so they're really important um, predictors of heat-related illness. Um, I have been on um, a couple of different field visits for work at oil and gas refineries, um, and they really, um, their alcohol and drug policy is super strict. Um, you shouldn't, they even recommend that you shouldn't be um, drinking when you're off the clock because it can affect your ability um, to handle heat when on the clock. Um, and so I was at a, an oil and gas refinery in Port Arthur, uh, Texas, so down in the Gulf Coast, and so in, just in July. So this came up a lot. Um, they have really a zero tolerance um, alcohol policy, um, even when off, off the clock. Um, so Alcohol, as we know, causes dehydration and central nervous effects. Um, so it can kind of compound with the other um, effects that heat causes on the body. Um, and then there are also certain um, drugs, prescription over the counter, um, particularly um, vasoconstrictors um, that can also um, act synergistically with heat and cause an increased risk of developing this. <clears throat> um, so acclimatization is the adaptation to um, heat or cold or thermal environment um, that's due to an increased capacity to sweat and dissipate heat, um, as well as a reduction in the loss of electrons. Um, so while you initially on, um, in a hot environment might develop a headache, um, sluggishness, other signs of heat exhaustion, um, repeated exposure to heat um, eventually reduces the strain of heat on your body um, and increases the body's capacity to sweat over time. Um, you also, um, the time it takes to start sweating is, um, is decreased so that you start sweating more, um, more quickly when you're working. Um, so you have a more potential to, for the sweat to evaporate and cool down. Um, as time goes on, your body also sweats more dilute, uh, which, is, which means it decreases the amount of salt and electrolytes it loses as you acclimatize. Um, so we see that after several days of work, um, the body's core temperature um, doesn't increase as quickly as it was increasing within the first day or two of work. Um, so acclimatization is particularly important or new workers. Um, so as we saw in that first example, um, almost half were uh, of the fatalities reported for that year were in uh, new workers on their first day. Um, and then it's also important for workers who have been away from work for more than two weeks. So you have to um, basically reacclimatize. Um, and we'll look at different guidelines that um, regulatory agencies have published um, for acclimatization, reacclimatization, new workers versus experienced workers. Um, so all of that has kind of been um, thought out by uh, different regulatory agencies. Um, so we see here um, that for an experienced worker on the first day of work, they recommended to only perform 50% of the full work assignment. Um, so that could be um, in the form of basically taking an eight hour day um, four hours of break. Um, if, if the temperatures are indicative of 
being at risk of simulated stress. Um, new workers between the first day are only recommended to perform 20% um, of the projected um, And then you also see with the reacclimatization guidelines, um, if you have less than four days of absence, you can come back on your first day and perform 100% of that work. Um, but that is not a responsibility. And then, as of the point of the slide, that we can get absence to illness. So, absence might be some kind of vacation where you're healthy, um, but illness is when you're obviously you're sick and your body is at a disadvantage. So, coming back to that um, high heat. Um, would take longer for the body to, to get These, I believe, are through NIOSH. No, these are the National Safety Council. NIOSH. Um, so, microclimates, as I mentioned, are also important considerations um, when an IH is assessing health risk and individuals in their workforce. Um, so movement of, of air over the skin maximizes um, removal of heat by both evaporation and convection, as we mentioned. Um, but protection, uh, protective clothing could compound um, thermal problems because it retains heat, your body's not able to sweat, um, the air is unable to, or it's able to sweat, but the air is unable to come uh, and evaporate the sweat and cool you down. Um, and waterproof clothing in particular is really uh, problematic in hot environments because that just totally retains the moisture within the protective um, So these are four basic questions that you need to ask yourself as an industrial hygienist um, in order to determine if a work, a work site should be evaluated for heat stress. Um, and if you answer yes to any of these questions, I would indicate that um, some kind of evaluation of heat stress should be undertaken. Um, so we want to know is the environment recognized as being hot, work demand is high, or is PPE required? Um, are workers' behaviors indicative of attempts to reduce heat stress? Is morale low, absenteeism high, people making mistakes? Um, I think um, low morale and absenteeism are um, really interesting. Um, I saw and that's not something that I typically thought of when thinking of heat stress and um, or as an indicator of potential heat stress. Um, but as I was visiting different schools throughout the summer, um, you would have a lot of absenteeism. People didn't want to come in on hot days. Um, there was um, one worker who was assigned to a particular school, but she knew that that school got really hot. So she would just go to another school every day. Um, so these are all important indicators that workers are experiencing heat stress and we should be evaluating it so we can come up with data and recommendations um, to mitigate the heat. Um, and then medical records, are they showing um, increased um, rates of um, symptoms associated with heat related illness? And then um, our body temperature, heart rate, sweat and loss levels um, high. Yeah, that might be more of um, that could be subjective or reported kind of, yeah. Yeah, if, if someone, if the worker comes to you and tells you that he's sweating more than typical, he's finding he's changing his clothes more often, that might be a sign of um, So there's no permissible exposure limit um, established by OSHA for heat stress. So as we saw in the first example, um, companies can be cited under the general duty clause of just providing that workplace is safe and without hazard. Um, NIOSH has introduced um, RALs, which are recommended alert levels, and RALs recommended exposure levels, um, which are the difference for unclimatized um, workers and climatized workers. And then we'll go into the graphs that NIOSH provides. Um, and then ACGIH also has um, threshold limit values um, that they established um, the current guidelines in 1979. Um, and these help to 
for an industrial hygienist um, to implement different work rest schedules for workers that are being exposed to excessive heat. Um, so these are the three main biological parameters that um, NIOSH lists for uh, heat stress to limit. So these are guidelines basically that you can use as an industrial hygienist to limit heat stress um, from a biological standpoint. Um, so the first one is um, basically maintaining a heart rate that um, is in, in excess of something that would be considered normal. Um, and so a good uh, a rule of thumb that a CGIH um, reports is taking 180 beats per minute and subtracting the person's age from it. And that should be the maximum um, heart rate that is sustained over several minutes. Um, so if you have a 40 year old individual in a heat stress environment, their maximum heart rate for three to four minutes should be 140 beats per minute. Um, there's also body core temperature recommendations. So for acclimatized workers, you shouldn't be exceeding 101. For unacclimatized, 100. Um, and then recovery heart rate when you're in a shaded area um, or during your work rest when required breaks. Um, at one minute, you shouldn't be exceeding 100. Um, so NIOSH, in addition to these kind of biological parameters, also recommends um, work rest schedules uh, based on the um, heat stress index. Um, so in order to understand um, how heat stress is measured in um, the environment. Um, I brought in a WVGC monitor. So this is the monitor that I use um, at the individual schools uh, this summer. Um, so it's pretty simple to use, and I think in the book there's maybe the manual or some, some operating instructions. Yeah, that's actually how I learned how to do this. I went to my website, downloaded the manual, um, saw just basically YouTube how to calibrate. Um, they call it a sequest temp three and sequest temp. Uh, how to calibrate it? It actually comes with um, kind of like this little key. So you basically unscrew the top, you plug this key in, and it has different parameters on it that the uh, instrument should use for these um, parameters within a certain amount, um, and that's how you know if it's uh, accurately. Um, so I won't pass it around if you guys want to come up for the break or afterwards if you're still having it. Um, this is um, a sphere, so this measures radiant heat and conductive heat. Um, this is the dry bulb, so it's just measuring the actual ambient temperature um, without the influence of moisture uh, in the air. And then this middle one is actually the, the wet bulb. Um, so you remove this top and you fill it with distilled water. And it has a little wick on it. Um, so you can remove it with the and everything. Um, so this wick um, sucks up the water and if they want to move it, it wicks. Um, and then there's also this guy, which I passed around. Um, so this is just like a portable uh, Whereas this, you can kind of read throughout the day. Um, so this is the equation to um, calculate the WBGT index. Um, as you can see, there's two here. So the top one is for um, outdoor measurements. Um, and that's for outside on a sunny day, it'll, um, it'll take into account um, more radia uh, radiation. Um, and then on the bottom, the indoor equation, 
You can use that for indoor environments um, or on cloudy or shady days. Um, so for the purposes of this class, we'll learn how to um, calculate uh, and use this equation. Um, but in practice, this instrument's really nice because it just tells you the, the index throughout the day. Um, so, the, so the globe temperature, it comes from this here. So it's measuring the radiation and the convective heat. Um, the wet, natural wet bulb is this middle, middle one, so that's measuring wind speed. And then the dry bulb temperature is this one that I think kind of looks like most of the burnouts, um, but it just measures like the ambient. Um, so we see from these calculations that there's more weight given to um, the natural wet bulb. Does anyone want to take a, a guess as to why that, why that is? I've kind of discussed it a little bit already. Yeah, yeah, so that's the indicator of humidity. Um, so in humid environments, as we mentioned, the body loses um, or is diminished. Capability of sweating is diminished. Um, we'll also mention here that this um, equation doesn't necessarily indicate um, workload or if PPE is being used. Um, so we can we have to do a few extra steps for those things. Um, so we can adjust for clothing. Um, and so we can add um, a factor to the final W. Um, BGT index that we calculate and simply add this um, add that to our final number um, or to the index to get the final uh, final index number in order to take into account PPE. Um, you'll notice here that these are in degrees Celsius. Um, so just be aware of that if you're ever using this um, table, you need to add Celsius to a Celsius uh, in index that's in Celsius or convert these to Fahrenheit if you have a WBUT index in Fahrenheit. Um, this comes from the ACGIH. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, mean, I don't know. Would it would it be because it's wicking away sweat faster? But then you have to change your shirt more often. Um, so maybe it just through like radiant heat, you're sweating less of your body. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll run through um, a little example now. Um, I should have put the equation here for you guys. But if you guys want to write down these parameters, these entries, then I'll put up the equation. Um, so we see that um, a construction worker, we're going to assume that he's acclimatized to the heat. He's removing lead paint um, from a bridge during a hot summer day. Um, we measure the natural wet bulb to be 28 degrees Celsius. Um, the globe temperature to be 32.8 degrees Celsius, and then the dry bulb to be 31.3 degrees Celsius. Um, so we want to calculate the um, index. Um, so if everyone has those down, go back to the equation. So our first um, Kind of thought as an industrial hygienist, what which equations are we going to want to use here, top or the bottom? Um, sorry. Wait. Well, so calculate what his index would be. Oh, why the top? Because it's the outdoor equation. Yeah, that one. Is. So the top one is at the, that one in an outdoor environment. The indoor one, you can use in indoor environments or if it's like a shady or cloudy day. Yep. 
Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, at least in my experience, I've seen it kind of like as a retroactive, like what was the key to potential key to the climate, like the mentality, or, um, or like in a, from a field work stuff, was, came from complaints from the workers saying that the environment was hot. So then we actually go in and take these measurements and compare them to the field use. Um, I would hope that it would be all kind of before a job started, but I don't know. Um, so does anyone have an answer for what the index would be? Anyone get it yet? Yep. Yeah, so 29.3.29 uh, degrees Celsius is the index. Um, so what if we said the worker was wearing um, polyolefin coveralls? What would the heat index be then? Yep, 30.29. So that's just because the polyolefin coveralls can go over here, which means add one degree Celsius to your heat index. So you have 30.29 points. Um, okay, so I mentioned that these equations don't necessarily take into account metabolic rate or the workload. Um, so this is something that we need to evaluate ourselves um, in, order to be in order to compare it to the TLVs. Um, so this classification is kind of subjective on the part of the uh, industrial hygienist, um, but you can determine this through um, observation or interviews with uh, your workforce. Um, for instance, office work uh, might be considered rest or light, um, but construction work might be heavy or very heavy, um, depending on the tasks that are, that are being performed throughout the day. Um, does anyone want to classify our construction worker removing lead from a bridge on a hot summer day? Yeah, yeah, I think so for these kind of subjective um, uh, decisions as an industrial hygienist that you're making just based on professional um, judgment, just always have some kind of of support or reason why you chose that. You say it's lighter. <laughs> um, so this chart um, from ACGIH is where we can um, compare the metabolic rate um, to the WBGT index. Um, so we saw we had an acclimatized worker. So we said he had a heavy uh, metabolic rate of about 400. So and the WBGT index was like 30 and 3. Um, so you go over to metabolic weight, you go up to 30, um, and we see that it does exceed the TLB um, for those uh, parameters. Um, so once we see this, we, we start to ask ourselves what kind of um, controls can we put into place um, that would mitigate some of these heat explosions. Um, so along with the um, TLVs, ACGIH has um, a work rest schedule. Um, so we saw for our, so TLVs are used for climatized workers, action limit, um, which is this dotted line are used for unacclimatized workers. You see that it's, it's lower. Um, so saying, suggesting you have um, an acclimatized worker, we said he was performing heavy work, um, 
and the WBGC measurement was 30, you might suggest that you perform 25% of the work that day. So these are um, similar charts from NIOSH. Um, these are kind of nice because they build in, you don't have to look at two charts, they build in the work that schedule. Um, so say we have someone with a metabolic output of about 350 to 400, um, and the WBGC is 30 still. You come up here and say you're in between um, 30 and 50 minutes um, per hour that you should be working. So, so, so that's like I said, it's kind of subjective um, and it goes back to like a chart like this that you find from like a NIOSH or OSHA recommendation. The uh, job title, job activities performed throughout the day. Um, that's like I said, you could interview with the workers um, when they think that they're performing the most work that would increase their metabolic rate, when they might be resting. Um, so I think it is, it is kind of, that's kind of, I think the art to industrial hygiene. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still deciding that. I had to talk to um, the union that I'm working with, and then Brian also. Um, but in, I have a couple of slides also we'll get to after the break. Um, but right now I classify that as moderate. Um, and then we'll take a break after this. Um, but this is a helpful guidance. Um, from OSHA that basically goes over a scenario where um, they retroactively evaluate heat exposure for, um, what was it, a 30 year old landscaper who passed away due to heat stroke. So you can kind of see from start to finish how they calculate the WBGT index um, and how they um, put that into kind of like a risk, a retroactive risk assessment for the situation. Um, so this is a really good guidance document. It's actually what I'm essentially basing my um, capstone on. As a um, okay, so we'll take like a few minute break and then we'll um, finish up with heat stress and move on to cold stress. Um, okay, so we also have um, psychrometric charts, uh, which are the graphical uh, relationship between um, these five parameters, the vapor pressure, the dry bulb, wet bulb, relative humidity, and dew point. Um, and so if you know at least two of these parameters, um, we can um, get all of them. Um, so for example, if you have uh, a wet bulb of 75, so left hand side, and a dry bulb of say 110, you go to where they intersect. Um, and then you move over to the right hand side here, you can see you have the valve. 70, um, the vapor pressure is 70 and the value of mercury. Um, and, so, and then this, uh, is the this curved line is the relative. You can kind of see where um, each of them would fall if you know at least two of the parameters. Um, so when we are uh, managing and implementing controls for heat stress, we have um, Two different types of controls, general or specific. Um, general are those that can be applied to kind of any um, heat stress related environment. So for example, just um, making sure you're replenishing with enough liquids, um, taking scheduled breaks, those might be considered more general controls. Um, specific controls might be um, insulation or wearing um, thermal resistant gloves when handling a certain piece of um, so they're specific for the task or the activity taking place. Um, training is probably the most effective form of control. So with training, we can um, inform workers to recognize signs and symptoms of heat stress um, and how to um, mitigate any um, heat related illnesses in the field. Um, and then we can also um, issue heat advisory. So Tony just kind of mentioned when he was working that they would issue a heat advisory for that day. So people are um, clued into, oh, heat advisory, that means I should really be watching how much water I'm taking 
making sure I'm taking my schedule breaks. Um, so scheduling is also another um, important general control. Um, so this would be kind of the time of day, the season, um, or the locale that we're performing the work in. Um, so when possible, you want to schedule work at night, um, during the morning or late in the day um, to avoid the hottest uh, times of the day. Um, as we just saw, work rest schedules are, are really important based on the WBGT index. Um, it's also important to um, remind workers to remove PPE during um, their rest intervals so that they can properly cool down. Um, and then we should also think about pacing of work. Um, so like elderly workers will want to set that pace lower um, so they don't have that capacity to dissipate heat as well as younger workers. Um, and then you can also think about sharing work, rotating workers to different hot jobs um, to kind of um, I guess spread the exposure of heat to more people, but that's also kind of one of those limiting factors of job rotation. You're exposing more people um, to the to the, the physical agent. Um, so we can also, um, as a general control, recommend um, fluid replacement throughout the day. Um, so we see that over the course of a work day on a hot day, workers can lose up to six liters of water, which is 13 pounds. Um, so workers should be encouraged to drink small volumes of liquid throughout the day. Um, they shouldn't be um, just drinking something when they're thirsty um, because thirstiness is an indicator of dehydration. Um, so by the time you get to that thirst, um, you're already dehydrated. Um, and then also as a recommendation, you should um, advise employees to drink one pint of liquids per hour that they're going to work before the actual job begins um, so that their body has enough um, liquids in the system to kind of replenish, replenish itself. Um, I guess it could be, I, yeah, I've seen just like a lot of water recommendations. You know, they sell just kind of like electrolyte packets. Um, I feel like eating can make you like, tired and kind of contribute to the heat stress um, and the effects of heat. So just kind of um, really focusing on water and fluid replenishment for, for actual like, beneficial. Um, do you have any experience with that? When I was down at the refinery, like on everyone's desk, they had just packets that you could pick up and they're kind of like, like energy, like salt, electrolyte questions you added to water. Um, so those are really, they were really important for how fun, fun life. Um, so in addition to some of these administrative controls, we can also implement um, different engineering controls in order to limit the gain of bodily heat and achieve a thermal balance. Um, so we typically want to reduce the temperature and humidity. Um, if feasible, we can also increase the airflow across the body, um, or we can um, isolate or insulate, uh, insulate different uh, heat sources and use PPE to also protect this. Um, so heat should be reduced to uh, 90 degrees in order to allow the body to cool itself. Um, workers do gain a significant amount of heat when ambient temperatures rise above 104 degrees. Um, dilution ventilation also brings a lot of, can bring cool air um, from the outside to dilute the warm air in an indoor, in an indoor environment. Um, active cooling uh, involves uh, refrigeration or air conditioning, so you're actually cooling the air um, in the environment. Um, and then, as we saw, humidity um, is a big player in uh, inducing heat stress. Um, so we could also think about lowering the water content in the room through the use of humid environments. Um, so by increasing the airflow, um, we increase evaporative and convective cooling. 
Um, Misting fans are really helpful. I don't know if any of you um, visit theme parks over the summer, but they, they always have misting fans on lines. Um, they're really effective ways of cooling down the body. Um, however, you should only increase airflow in um, environments with less than 95 less than 95 degree temperatures. Um, otherwise, increasing the airflow contributes to convective heat, like in the con convection oven. You're actually heating the, the air above 95 degrees. Um, so we can also um, insulate um, equipment to reduce heat exposure um, or isolate it. Uh, when we isolate it, we partition um, or separate it from the rest of the plant. Um, an example of this would be um, maybe locating the boiler um, in a separate part of a plant from where the work is going to take place. Um, we can also insulate the heat sources with insulation so that um, heat isn't radiating off of the equipment and pipes. Um, it also prevents against um, different conduction hazards. So someone accidentally slips and grabs onto the hot pipe as a so catch their fall, they're not being instantly burned, there's some insulation there. Um, we could also reduce the emissivity of hot surfaces, so that would be like um, painting it with a reflective kind of coating um, so that they radiate less heat. <clears throat> um, different PPE um, that's available for thermal, thermal stress include circulating air and water systems. Um, so these are kind of um, vests that you can wear um, under your clothing that are intended to decrease or remove body heat. Um, so air currents can be circulated underneath the, cur uh, the clothing um, uh, or water can circulate. Um, these are best used um, because of their bulk and kind of where they're situated on the body. These are best used during um, periods of, of rest, during these work rest schedules. Um, we also have reflective vests that many of us have seen. So these reflect radiant heat and contribute to less thermal stress. Um, can anyone think of some limitations um, based on these images and just what you might know of, of these different types of best limitations for implementing this kind of PPE in hot environments? Expensive, sure. Yeah, that can be a limiting factor. Yeah, they're not necessarily, yeah, made for protecting from heat. Um, as I kind of mentioned, they'd be more of use when you're doing, when you're resting, kind of bring down the core temperature. They're not necessarily going to um, protect from any welding hot exposures. Um, sorry? Worker compliance, yeah. How do you get people to, to actually want to wear these? Um, yeah, the added bulk and weight, um, they're actually going to be doing work that looks really bulky and heavy. I don't want to be wearing that. Um, you also, for the circulating air and water systems, potentially need a source of water or air connected to something. Um, you also, because you're covering the body, losing potential for evaporative cooling. So all just different things to keep in mind if you're um, evaluating the cost benefits of using PT in hot environments. Um, so I wanted to mention a little bit about my project here. Um, so over the summer, I partnered with um, DC 37, um, which is the largest labor union here in, uh, in New York. Um, so they represent all sorts of different workers, specifically within the schools. They um, represented the kitchen workers, uh, school aides, um, workers like that. So we went in um, to nine different schools uh, so far. I'm still, I still have one left on my list uh, to visit. Uh, I measured the WGBT index throughout the whole shift, uh, which was about five to seven hours. Um, and then also CO2 and CO levels um, and ventilation measurements. Um, but I'm just going to talk to you today about um, and then again, like I mentioned, I use that OSHA technical manual as um, kind of kind of the guiding document in order to teach us uh, an exposure assessment. 
Um, so this is one of our uh, my setup. So here's the, the unit. Um, in front of it is a high C calc, so that measures the CO CO2 levels. And I tried to put it, these are pretty good items. Um, um, so I tried to put it in the place where um, it would most likely be the highest uh, heat exposure. So we can get like a worst case read for the W. WBVP index. Um, so you'll also see that this should be placed at a, a, a table level. Um, that's one of the recommendations in the manual. Um, and then also when you're placing the um, WBGT monitor, you should also let it run for 10 to 15 minutes, it's recommended, just to kind of acclimate itself in the environment. Um, this is another kitchen. Um, so you see kind of located near the hot. The kitchen has stoves. Um, a lot of these public school kitchens are, um, are known as just kind of reheat kitchens. They're taking frozen food and heating it up in the oven and not necessarily um, cooking uh, fresh foods on the oven. Um, we also see here that we have um, a local ventilation uh, system. Um, it kind of depended on the school if the if either the cook started the ventilation system at the beginning of the shift, if they remember to do that, um, or if the ventilation systems were working. So there are some schools where these, these weren't working, um, but they do help to dissipate the heat that's coming off of the hot equipment. Um, I've noticed in places like um, Dunkin' Donuts or like Sweet Green for their uh, oven, they actually make one of the kind of systems that goes over the oven. And I don't know if that's I think that's kind of like a newer technology. Um, I don't know how much is actually, because this is like a very area of the kitchen, so I don't know how much actually the ventilation is, is dissipating the heat, um, or if it's like a more targeted way to help. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they were, the next one, but they were all over. Um, so mostly in Brooklyn, maybe two or three in Manhattan, and then one in the Bronx. Yeah. Um, so this is just Yeah, yeah, so that was, um, I'm preempting everything, one of like the limitations, no worries, <laughs> uh, one of the limitations or um, one of the limitations to this study. So the, um, the original um, thought behind this and the DC wanted us to go into the summer because of the hotter temperatures. So they thought that they would have hotter reading. Um, but a lot of these schools are, that I was visiting are closed. They don't have um, as many people coming in. They are, they are open um, in the summer to just uh, feed the community. Anyone under 18 can go get a um, but it's, I haven't like looked at the actual, like I got the count for the list of that today, um, but it's like hundreds during the school year that are maybe like 12, 15 lunches during the day. So I think that's, yeah, one of the limitations that I have in my research. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. A lot of them, like, a lot of them had windows open, um, doors to the outside open. Yeah. I mean, I think that the age of the equipment and just the age of these buildings in general. Um, there was one kitchen that had one exhaust vent for the entire kitchen. Um, so they're just, I don't know, if they're just not designed to, to properly mitigate these stress in the kitchen. So they do, there were some times that it would it really felt like the entire room was an oven, um, where I would go outside and sit in the cafeteria and uh, they would have to be, they'd be both inside and serving lunches. Um, they're also, I don't, I don't have a picture of it, but they also um, have Kind of like the uh, table steamers, so they're they're standing over serving food and that's another really 
high source of heat. Um, and only the cook um, has access to those ovens. So you have a lot of hands on the left. Um, but they did, depending on the size of the kitchen, how many doors or windows were open, they could get really, really hot. Um, and so this is, I thought this was a cool picture. This is an old pizza oven. Um, you can take some of these to heat the ovens. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So a lot. I mean, all of the schools have fans. They tend to get out of the kitchen um, or blow into the kitchen. I would say at least every school had two mechanical fans um, for the reason. Um, there was one school that had the air conditioning. Um, they had four different units. They were all broken. Um, and so I haven't looked at. I haven't gone through all the data yet. I haven't looked. And temperatures were above that 95 degree threshold if it's actually if the mechanical fan is helping or hurting stress. I think that's another good, good thing to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they have these mechanical fans. Yeah. Um, it's something that they've wanted to do for the past decade, they said, but they just have never gotten someone to do it. Um, so they've had complaints for years and years and years from these workers, but they haven't had any data to support or to go in to look at something in school. Um, yeah, I mean, they want basic, I mean, I think they would like to do all the schools if possible. Um, I think one of the limitations of this study was that I only went to a single school on a single day and didn't really get a representative of what happened throughout the summer. So I think that was maybe the next iteration pick Harriet Tubman and you go every day throughout the summer and you leave the monitor reading and see what the fluctuations are throughout the week. Um, these are just really kind of like snapshots. Yeah, yeah. So I, I took all the ventilation measurements and just didn't present them here. Um, but so yeah, I was looking at um, ventilation of the of the hoods um, and also the general um, exhaust and supply, um, just to see what types of ventilation there was. Um, relate that to CO2 and CO levels and, and heat in these environments. So yeah, trying to get trying to characterize as many things as I could, but for the purposes of this presentation, just Kind of focusing on the heat. Um, but if you guys are in cash the next semester, you'll hear all about it. Um, so I found, so I um, estimated that metabolic rate of medium work. Um, this gives you the index throughout the day. Um, so I compared that to um, uh, a TLV based on that uh, ECGAH's chart and found one that had exceeded the TLV. Um, and then others that were kind of close, um, and then two that kind of cool. Um, and there were those two schools I remember um, being kind of like chilly that day. It was like a 50 degree day in June or something, and it just um, it didn't, it never got hot. Um, yeah, yeah. I think so. They give you it gives you like the average for the seven hours there. So those are my the average temperatures. Um, I, I think the max for this one got up to I think eighty six. The max rate. Um, 
Um, and the, the 3M software that you use to download all the data is pretty cool because it, it like graphically um, plots everything. So you can see throughout the day how humidity is really high at the beginning and kind of dissipates how it heats up until 10 or 11 during like the uh, beginning of the lunch rush and then it kind of falls until 1 or 2 p.m. Um, so it's a cool graphical representation that the, the software does for you. Um, and so we talked about a little bit. I, I think for sensitive population, I think that's an interesting one. Um, a lot of the workers were kind of like middle-aged women. So kind of talking about those risk factors, um, does, is that contributing to potential sensitivity for heat stress um, in, these, in this worker population? Um, so now we'll finish with cold stress. Um, so this is a different um, kind of problem and it needs to be um, looked at differently from an NIH perspective. Um, as we know, biological responses consist of shivering or trying to warm your body, also reducing the blood circulation to the skin so you're not um, dissipating heat and you're retaining um, heat for the internal organs. Um, these aren't necessarily the best um, the biological responses aren't necessarily the best um, forms of preventing um, cold stress-related illnesses. Um, so we'll see that behavioral um, changes, so um, wearing warm clothing as insulation, seeking warm shelter, um, increasing activity levels are um, the most important mechanisms for, for protecting against cold. Um, so these are some at-risk workers um, for cold stress. Um, so miners we see both in hot and cold environments. Um, can anyone think of another example? It might be a at-risk population. Sorry, BMS, sure. Yeah, yeah, airbag handlers, the people that are doing, yeah, the way the, the flagging, um, even fishermen, the cold stress example. Um, so yeah, like like heat and stress, they can cold stress can affect many different industries and workers. Um, so the two main climatic factors that influence cold stress are cold air temperature and high wind velocity. Um, so when temperatures decrease and or we increase wind velocity, um, heat loss occurs um, or it's increased. We see more risk of cold stress related health effects. Um, we'll also touch on water vapor and then contact with cold surfaces in the water a little bit. Um, so this is a graphical representation of the cooling power of wind on exposed skin. Um, so we see that um, on a temperature where it's zero degrees Fahrenheit out, on a calm day, the feel like temperature is zero. We can go all the way down to negative 63 degrees. Fahrenheit, the temperature, yeah. two miles per hour. Um, you see in these more extreme temperatures, you're getting to these danger levels. Um, basically, stay out, stay indoors, don't go outside um, when temperatures fall and wind speeds increase, um, which I, I think all of us living in New York know just from walking around and how much wind it affects the cold feel. Um, so at temperatures below 20 degrees, um, you should recommend that workers um, wear insulating gloves. Um, and then also at high wind speeds, you can recommend um, windbreakers to protect you from the wind. As like a strict cutoff, use your judgment. But, you know, depends on how long I guess they're outside. So. <laughs> Definitely not for me. <laughs> um, so these are um, wind chill recommendations. Oh, 
Um, so it's a little difficult to see, so I'll um, let you maybe review it at home. Um, but just different um, health concerns or recommendations for various categories of, of wind chill. So you might want to break this out when as the uh, winter is approaching to see if your local weather station is giving you accurate recommendations. Um, so these are work rest TLVs for cold stress. Um, so I think these are really interesting because you can see here that the TLVs are at really low temperatures, um, negative 15 degrees. So there's no noticeable wind and it's negative 15 degrees out. The CGA recommends that the work should have normal breaks. Um, so that's one in a four hour shift. So if you're working an eight hour shift, you'll have a total of three one during that first four hours lunch and then one during the, you know, the last four hours um to me that just seems kind of crazy that it can get that low and that's where the government kind of starts recommending exposure limits does anyone else agree or have experience with those cold temperatures Negative 15. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 Okay, so these are some of the uh, two areas of health effects that we'll talk about. So we see localized tissue damage in the form of um, frostbite or trench foot. Um, and then there's also um, hypothermia, which is a system of, uh, systemic. Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, so frostbite is the freezing of tissue due to um, exposure to extreme cold or contact with cold objects. Um, symptoms can range from um, uh, erythema, which is redness, slight pain. Um, it can progress into blistering, um, ischemia, um, which is reduced blood flow, thrombosis, blood clotting, cyanosis, and, and your peripherals turning, and periphery turning blue, um, and gangrene, which is um, basically necrotic tissue. Um, so in order to um, treat this, you can rewarm um, and avoid trauma to the affected area. Um, there are some instances where this might need uh, medical attention, but uh, can dissipate on its own with proper treatment. Rapid warming, yeah. Um, so trench foot um, occurs from long continuous exposures to damp or cold environments. Um, and this doesn't necessarily require freezing temperatures um, to occur. It's occurred in uh, documented cases where um, it's 60 degrees out, and it's really that prolonged exposure to um, cool water um, or liquids. Um, it gets its name um, from uh, soldiers during World War I when they were in trenches um, or walking around cool, muddy waters for extended periods of time. Um, so we see paleness and ischemia in the feet, um, super let's see, hyperemia, which is increased blood flow, uh, paralysis, edema, um, and gangrene again. So similar um, uh, symptoms as frostbite, um, but very different. I didn't want to show like a real picture of trench foot. You guys can look that up on your own. <laughs> um, uh, but it does look uh, different, a little different than frostbite. Um, it can be prevented by keeping the feet clean, warm, and, and dry. 
Um, and then we have hypothermia, which many of us are familiar with. So this is a systemic or body-wide effect of cold exposures. Um, so it occurs when the core temperature drops below um, 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and as it progresses, the depression of the central nervous system um, gets more severe. So we might start off with shivering, which eventually um, devolves into reduced mental alertness and consciousness. Um, and even death um, may occur. Um, it's, uh, it's, and then at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, if, if your hypothermia progresses to that, um, that's when cardiac arrest occurs. Um, so to counteract the effects of this, you definitely need um, medical attention, but more immediately um, provide adequate insulated clothing, uh, move the worker to a warm, dry environment, try to, um, if they're conscious and or alert enough to drink some warm liquids to, to warm, their core, warm their core temperature. Um, so we can also um, think about PPE or clothing when preventing cold stress. So we want to recommend at least three layers of clothing. Um, there's actually another bullet. So a moisture wicking layer um, internally, then insulating um, middle layer to keep in the, the heat, and then an outer um, wind or, or rain water protection layer. Um, also wear hat, insulated boots or gloves in cold environments. Um, and then this one's important, keep, always keep an extra pair of dry clothing on hand. Um, if clothing ever gets wet, it loses its insulating properties. And as we saw through that convective uh, heating, it's gonna, uh, your body's gonna cool down much faster when wearing cold, uh, wet clothing. Um, and then we also have similar administrative controls. So like we saw TLVs that provide work rest um, schedules, constant supervision. So making sure um, uh, the buddy system is in place or the foremen are, are, are watching their workforce. Um, the work rate should, be, should not be too high so that you're um, sweating and, and making your clothing wet. Um, but you should also balance that with not um, sitting or standing still for too long, kind of to strike that that good balance. Um, and then again, just um, proper training of the workforce so that um, your employees can recognize the signs and symptoms of cold stress, what to do if, if they do recognize this uh, in the field. Um, and so that's what I've got for today for thermal stress. Any questions?